Hello and welcome to A Wee Bit of War, a podcast dedicated to telling the stories of Northern Ireland during the Second World War. I'm your host, Scott Edgar, and in this episode, we're joined by the fantastic Dr. Joseph Quinn of the University of Oxford. We've got a lot to talk about, including the ongoing Their Finest Star project. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, it's taken us a while to get here. We've been talking about being on podcasts together for probably about a year, and uh, we're delighted to finally have you on. Thank you very much, Scott. It's a great pleasure to be on. Uh, some of our listeners may have heard you on other podcasts or met you at the incredible We Have Ways Fest or heard you speak in Belfast at the Linen Hall or the Ulster Reform Club. But for those who have not yet had the pleasure, uh, can you give us a little introduction? Okay, well, um, my particular background, Scott, is um, I did my PhD research at Trinity College Dublin. Uh, on the topic of Irish voluntary recruitment into the British forces during the Second World War. And I have since been, I, I have published um, a, a, a considerable deal in terms of scholarly work. I've also been published quite frequently in newspapers and I've been interviewed quite a lot about this particular research. And I'm working towards the publication of my first monograph uh, with, um, with a reputable academic publisher. Um, but for the moment, I currently work for Oxford University on their Finest Era project, which is a digital humanities crowdsourcing project, uh, which explores the public history and heritage of the Second World War and aims to digi digitize it for future generations. So that's really my um, that's really my current stall. And I have also quite a, deal, a great deal of experience working for academia and also the uh, cultural heritage sector in the UK and Ireland built up over the last number of years. So you might say that I'm more of a sort of a general Second World War specialist and I straddle academia and the cultural heritage sector. Um, that's really my, my background. Uh, we've met up a few times and as tends to happen, it turns into hours of chat about the Second World War. Um, what what was it that prompted your interest in this particular part of our history? Well, I do remember, it's a very interesting question. I do remember in the 1990s, I remember staying with my uh, aunt and uncle in near Greystones in County Wicklow. And I remember uh, in the bedroom where I was staying and it was my it was my uncle's house, my then uncle's house. He, unfortunately, he died of cancer but within about a year of, of that um, a year of that uh, of that time. He went downhill very suddenly. But in his um, spare bedroom, he had an, an, a huge collection of books. And one of the books that I picked up and it was quite possibly a very well known title um, on the emergency in Ireland during the Second World War. I picked it up when I woke up one Saturday morning and I ended up leafing through it. And it just sort of, I, I had this awareness of the war, of the Second World War from an early age. I remember, I think, probably seeing, you know, black and white newsreel footage of the um, of Operation Barbarossa, German steel helmeted soldiers on motorbikes trundling across steeps and I, I i remember being captivated by this image but it seemed a quite a quite a terrifying very dark conflict i only really began to engage with it sort of in the mid to late 1990s and funny enough it was around about i was very young but around about that time was when commemoration culture in ireland uh, towards the commemoration of Ireland's role in the second world war that was when that was beginning to kick off and i was completely unaware of um, the significant, the later significance of all of this, but my personal cognizance of it uh, stemmed from that Saturday morning, uh, waking up at my aunt's house and looking through this book and um, just taking in, you know, sort of the, you know, the very the constrained and very unusual situation that the Republic of Ireland, or what was then known as Independent Ireland or the Irish Free State found itself in upon the declaration of war by Britain on Germany in 1939 and how the Irish government managed to, you know, sort of manage this balancing act. And I had no idea how complex a topic it was going to be. I had no idea how nuanced it was going to be. And I really didn't imagine myself doing a PhD connected with it uh, so many years later. 
Um, of course, in terms of my own personal interests in the Second World War, I remember being at an Irish language Gael school in County Waterford, Colosh and Aruna. And I remember um, picking up um, another book which had um, conveyed an illustrated history of the Second World War. And I was blown away. I was just thinking to myself, oh, my God, this is like Star Wars, but it actually happened. It was it was just incredible, really. I just couldn't get over it. I remember, I always remember the famous painting of, um, you know, of, of the Dam Busters, right, the anniversary of which took, the 80th anniversary of which just took place very recently. And I saw this painting in this illustrated history, this Lancaster going in, attacking the Mona Dam and just the, this this barrel bouncing across the water. I was just like, what the heck is going on here? What is this? This is cool. Um, I just, I just, I couldn't get over it. And then I think what really sealed the deal, Scott, if you want, want to know the truth, my late grandfather, when I came home on holiday from this Gale Skull, Colossian and Arena, uh, on my first, first holiday from it, um, he popped in to see me on a Friday evening. I was only a few hours home and he said, Joe, I'm on my way in to uh, see uh, this film called Saving Private Ryan. Um, would you like to come with me? And, you know, d don't tell anybody, but um, I may not have been um, of the right age to actually go and see that film. I think it was uh, rated 15 or something like that, but he took me in anyway. And uh, yes, um, I will never forget. Uh, I think as everybody else will remember that visual assault um, that happens in the first 30 minutes of, of that, that amazing film, which was first part of which was filmed at Kirklow Beach, County Wexford, only just up the coast from where I was actually in Irish college. So um, I just remember being very aware of that and my awareness of it gradually grew. And it just became, I think, like anybody like yourself, Scott, who's fascinated with the Second World War, I think it was just it was just something that turned into an obsession. And I'm one of these people who's lucky enough to have made it a professional pursuit. Yeah, there are those incredible connections everywhere, you know, from just just picking up a book as a as a child, or I used to hear stories about my grandfather. Um you know, when I, when I was young, um, he, he passed away when I was only five years old. But people around Portadown used to always um, say um, Alec Liggett drove every single car he ever had like he drove a tank. And yeah. uh, I was just like, you know, you're five, six years old and, and hearing that, you know, someone in your family drove a tank through the desert. And, you know, all of this, this kind of superhero, like you said, it's like Star Wars, you know, but it's it's real. Yeah. This happened. Um, yeah. And and having all those little connections with Ireland as well. You know, the, the Saving Private Ryan scenes uh, filmed here. Um, you know, we could we could go off on so many tangents and we're, we're likely going to cover a few topics today. But um, high on the list for me will be your latest project, which you've already mentioned is their finest star. Um, let's for anyone who doesn't know, let's take it back to basics. What is their finest star? OK, so their finest star is uh, what we call a digital humanities crowdsourcing project. So what do we mean by that? Well, Digital Humanities is essentially, for, for those who are un unfamiliar with the term, um, it's something that you practice, Scott, with your with your particular endeavour, Wartime and I. That is a Digital Humanities uh, um, project in essence. And what it is, is essentially taking um, cultural humanities, it could be literature, it could be history, taking it to people by digital means. And in terms of their finest hour, what we're doing with that, is we are essentially digitally engaging with a very large audience in the UK and Northern Ireland, basically the United Kingdom, Britain and Northern Ireland, as well as beyond um, through digital means, through podcasting, through um, social media. But in particular, what we are doing, the crowdsourcing element is we are reaching out to the public and we are saying, we have a website with a direct upload facility. If you have a story, a family story from the Second World War, you can upload this to our website from the comfort of your own home if you're willing to share it. You can upload images, you can up, uh, upload images of original photographs, of objects that are in your possession, of uh, you can upload JPEGs, um, you can upload PDF documents that could contain memoirs, 
um, of your grandfather or grandmother or great uncle's service in the Second World War or somebody that you knew. Um, and you can give, um, you know, a few paragraphs or many paragraphs, as many as you want, about this. And you can also fill out a survey about in terms of how the war has impacted upon you. And it was very interesting how you began the conversation, Scott, with sort of how did we get, how did I get interested in the Second World War? What fascinated you about the Second World War and got the hook in you? Um, what this project is also about is about surveying not the wartime generation, the few members of the wartime generation that are left, but the generations that have come after, the children of the wartime generation, the grandchildren of the wartime generation, and so on, and what their particular impression of the conflict is, what their impression of the wartime generation is, and how, how, how in-depth is their consciousness and awareness of the Second World War, how good is their knowledge of this conflict, and how do they contextualize the family stories that they have, the stories of their family's service in the Second World War with the actual events of the Second World War, how well are these married up? And we don't seek to correct people's information, we seek to, to obtain and then later analyze the information as it is given to us. We will not correct people for anything that um, any historian might regard as factually inaccurate or anything like that. We take the information as you give it to us because we want to know exactly what it is. What, 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 how has the story been related to you? How has it been told to you? How have you remembered it? That's what we're looking to capture. And this is really, it's, it, it's, it's a unique project, but it's not the first of its kind. It's based on a model called the Oxford Community Collections model, which was pioneered by our project leader, Dr. Stuart Lee, uh, who's based at the Faculty of English at the University of Oxford and has done many projects like this, um, beginning with Poetry of the First World War, which is also a digital humanities initiative from over 10 years ago, uh, received, attracted quite a bit of funding. But this later led to an initiative called Lest We Forget, which is actually the immediate precursor project to this particular project. Lest We Forget was the first World War equivalent of this project. It was smaller in scale, ran fewer events, but collected quite a lot of items and was connected with a much wider a pan-European First World War crowdsourcing initiative called Europeana in 1914-18, which a lot of people may remember from a number of years ago. There was actually a roadshow event held in Ireland that Stuart Lee was actually a part of. And this crowdsourced the public history heritage of every of the First World War. But the reason this project is different is quite simply because this connects with a conflict that actually, it was not that the First World War doesn't connect uh, very emotionally and very intimately with people. Of course it does. It's a cornerstone of the culture of remembrance within this country, within the whole of the United Kingdom. But the Second World War is a hollowed, very almost sacred, venerated period in British history now, which I think people have universal regard for. And it is one of these, It's all, it's all, even though it happened about eight, 70 to 80 odd years ago, it's um, it's taken upon itself an almost foundational significance in terms of the history of this country. It has surpassed every single event um, that is uh, regarded as a sort of a cornerstone event within British history. And because of its importance, the level of public interest that we are getting is significantly greater than it was with Let's We Forget. And also, finally, it has transpired that this project is turning out to be something of a monster. We are having more and more people sign up more and more events every week. At one point, I can't tell you exactly how many events we have in the calendar, but I can tell you that we have so many that on one particular weekend in September, we'll have about maybe between 12 and 15 events running in that one weekend um, all around the UK. We have, we have so many people coming to us that um, we're, we're, we're quite considerably stretched and we had the volume of submissions that are coming in through our online archive is getting larger and larger and is multiplying um, with every passing week. 
So we're actually at a point where we, we feel we're actually about to go viral. We're not quite there yet, but we've 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 become we've become quite well known throughout the country. And um, we have a year to go. And during that year, we are going to do our very best, our level best to try and get this project to as many places in the UK as possible to try and seep it into every corner of the UK so that we can soak up as much as we can and just make the best of this wonderful opportunity. And last thing I wanted to say is the reason that we're doing this now is because we don't feel that we should be waiting until the centenary because of the experience of the first, of having done this for the First World War. There was a general feeling that waiting for the centenary had been too long to wait. And the reason was that this the First World War had actually faded. People didn't realise, but it had faded from living memory. The Second World War is still within living memory. And there's still quite a lot of people alive who witnessed or experienced the Second World War in one form or another, either as veterans or eyewitnesses. So we still have them. They are very few in number, but we still have them. But while we have the veterans and eyewitnesses, the participants, the people who are alive, who remember this, and while we have it fresh within living memory, it is important to capture it now. And um, because once we reach that threshold where it begins to pass from living memory, we'll have lost that opportunity. And that's why we are doing this project now on um, around about the 80th anniversary of many key events, such as the Dambusters raid, as opposed and the upcoming 80th anniversary of D-Day, as opposed to uh, waiting until the, the, when the centenary comes along. Uh, so you mentioned there... Um... You know, the, the number of events that are coming up that um that weekend in September sounds absolutely hectic. Uh, good luck with that. Um, I am looking forward to working alongside you and the team on Northern Ireland's first digital collection day. Um, I will put a link to um, all the details in the show notes of this episode. But uh, can you tell us what is happening in Northern Ireland and when? Yes. So um. The 17th of June, Saturday, the 17th of June, between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., I think, in the afternoon. I think that's the time we agreed. Um, the uh, Linen Hall Library um, in Belfast, one of the oldest uh, institutions of its kind in, on the island of Ireland, uh, will be hosting a their finest hour digital collection day event. Uh, or what we would call a DCD. So a Digital Collection Day event is is a one-day event, typically, which normally happens at a weekend, typically on a Saturday, where um, where people are invited to come from, from wherever they're traveling from, um, and they attend in person, and they bring along their items of physical wartime heritage, um, cases of documents it could be photographs um it could be it could be if they were bringing bringing materials pertaining to a member of their family who served in the royal air force they could bring along their logbooks uh, service logbooks from the time in service um if they're serving in the navy they could bring along sort of scrapbooks of their service and similarly for the army as well and we're interested in a whole variety of heritage and it's just important to note that you know people were probably wondering, you know, sort of, you know, why are we holding events when we are taking submissions um, online from, you know, people can upload from the comfort of their own homes. It's important to note that um, we have two methods of um, submitting and also re and receiving um, um, material from, from our participants. Our participants are the people who come to us with their material and give us their stories and agree to give their family stories to us um, for digital preservation. The two methods we have are online submission that a person can do themselves, anybody can do it um, through our website. You go to theirfinesthour.org and you click the button, share your story, and you go through it to, direct to a direct submissions form and you just fill that out and you can upload or attach any materials that you want to add to that submission. But the second method is the digital collection day. That's what will be happening in Belfast on Saturday, June 17th. At this particular event, um, people will be able to come. They will be arrive at a welcome desk where they will be given 
a series of forms to fill out. And then they will proceed to an interview desk where they will be interviewed in detail about their story. And at that interview desk, there will be an audio recorder in the background capturing basically the audio of their discussion with the interviewer. And the interviewer will also be taking down notes on what is known as a story form. And they will go through one by one the objects or items that have been brought in for digitization. And then after that, um, after the interview stage is complete, the person will go away to a waiting area and their materials will be taken to what's known as the digitization desk or the digitization stage. This is the third stage of the process. And their materials will go through a very ordered, well-organized system where they will go through a check-in area and then they will be brought to a desk where they will be photographed or scanned. Their items will be photographed and any documents or photographs will be scanned and they will be scanned in a particular order. And then once that's all done, it will be taken to a done area and then they'll be, they will be handed back to their owners. Their owners will be called forward, kind of like a cloakroom system. And, you know, and you'll have a ticket and everything like that and it'll all be handed back. And that will be the process done. We have a fourth stage, of course, which doesn't involve the participant, it involves our volunteers, the people who will be taking part in the event as organizers and running the event and running the very stages of the event. These are the volunteers that, of, um, that we are recruiting throughout the country. What the volunteers do for the fourth stage is essentially they take these forms and all the information contained therein. Um, as well as the digital copies of everything that they've photographed or digitized. And then they gradually upload everything to our online archive in the same way that one can from the comfort of their own home. And that, in essence, encompasses what a digital collection day is. But there are other aspects to digital collection day. People could have the collection day as part of one particular event. They could run festive activities. They could have reenactors. There could be guest speakers invited along to um, supplement the activities of a digital collection day. And of course, you can go off, you know, particularly in the Linen Hall, you have a wonderful cafe while you're waiting in the queue for your to be interviewed or have your items digitized if there's a long way you can go down to the Lynn Hall Library Cafe which is a kind of wonderful cafe there and you can have a, a nice latte and you know um, a cream cake or something like that or a carrot cake um, I'm, I'm probably revealing my own personal taste but um, this is something you can do and you can explore the library while you're there and that's one of the reasons why we in our in our aim to uh, coordinate these events, we look to partner with prestigious institutions like the Linen Hall that have, you know, there's so much to see and do. Um, you know, there's sort of there's amenities on site uh, that one can avail of. And, um, and it's important to note that the particular event that we're running at the Linen Hall uh, on June 17th is, is a particular kind of event that we know that is known as a joint event. And that's essentially a partnership event with a major institution. And we have at least eight of these lined up um, throughout the country, of which I think, I believe the Linen Hall is the first. It was, it's the first joint event happening anywhere in the UK. And what a joint event is, is essentially partnering with a major national or regional institution, one of great significance to capturing the heritage of that particular part of the UK. And um, the Linen Hall event, we hope, will inaugurate a series of what we call Community Collection Day events throughout, um, held throughout Northern Ireland, which will capture the very rich uh, and very nuanced uh, public history and heritage of Northern Ireland's war effort during the Second World War, inclusive of the domestic war effort, industrial production, um, the endurance of the people of Northern Ireland against the uh, the rigors of censorship, you know, enemy attacks from the air, inclu including the Belfast Blitz. That's an event that we would be looking to mark in great detail. We would be looking for anybody with any memories about the Belfast Blitz to come forward. And also of particular interest, his life on the home front, service in the Ulster Home Guard um, or local volunteer force. Um, 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 work in the industrial heartlands of Northern Ireland um, 
agricultural work, um, also politics as well. We'd be looking to capture, we would like to capture, uh, get a snapshot of what it was like, you know, sort of from the point of view of both unionist and nationalist politics, um, from whatever community you're from, uh, from whatever particular interest or party your um, family backed during the Second World War. We would like to hear from you. We would like you to come forward and convey a, an impression of what political life was like in your particular locality during the Second World War. And um, we're, we are interested in the unionist story, particularly with regard to local elections and and um, unionist impressions of war service during the Second World War, as well as from the nationalist side. We would like people who um, whose relatives served or worked during the Second World War to come forward. We would like people who were related to, who had ancestors who took part in the anti-conscription campaigns that took place in Northern Ireland in the early part of the war to come forward. Um, and um, we, 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 there are no holds barred. You can share with us whatever you choose or whatever you choose not to, because bear in mind, this is, this is, this is a period in history which is pre the Northern Ireland Troubles, um, it might still be there might be certain sensitivities here and there, but um, the fact of the matter is that we are this is now so long ago that um, people can feel free to share their stories and share the fullness of their stories. And we're hoping that we get a, a very significant engagement from both communities in Northern Ireland in this project, um, not to convey you know, sort of a uh, an impression of a sunny, pleasant little um, region of the UK that rendered, you know, sort of keep calm and carry on or whatever. We want to cap it. Northern Ireland will have quite a nuanced story in connection with the Second World War, a very nuanced story, quite, quite different to other regions of the UK. And we want to capture that story in all its complexity as an, an entry point to possibly running um, comparable events um, south of the border in the future, um, because we hope to bring this project hopefully to Southern Ireland as well when, when the opportunity arrives. Uh, so a word that has come up uh, quite often in this episode so far is uh, nuance, and uh, Northern Ireland has a, a very nuanced Second World War story. Um, it, it's got a lot of unique quirks and, and differences from uh, the rest of even the, the rest of the United Kingdom. Uh, we cover a lot of them on this podcast, but we've never really kind of stepped back and looked at the big picture. Um, Joe, as a, as a sort of overview, what was life like in Ulster for people during the Second World War? Well, one of the things I would say is that at the beginning, um, of the war in Northern Ireland, um, it was like um, it was really like Northern Ireland had emerged out of a really dark, you know, um, period in its history. Really, really black period. I mean, I, I've spoken to Northern Irish war veterans, and um, thinking of um, Billy McConnell, who served in the First Royal Ulster Rifles, um, was a D-Day veteran. Um, Billy McConnell uh, before the war um, remembered that the um, you know, the industrial areas of Belfast were largely um, dormant. You know they weren't completely shut down, but they were dormant. There was very little happening. He said there was nothing going on um, in terms of industrial activity. It was very much the same in in um, in, in what later became Neutral Ireland as well. There was very little economic activity. There was some pickup during the later years of the war, particularly with rearmament and sort of a general economic recovery. I mean, the fact that 25% or close on 25% of British national GDP was been plowed into, um, into re rearmament might have done much to reinvigorate war and sort of general British industry and, and what became the war industries in particular. But Belfast only really started to come to life in 1939 in the lead up to the war. Um, but uh, there are memories that I've come across of even by 38, things were still, um, you know, sort of quite depressed. And um, there was quite a lot of drudgery in terms of people's personal lives um, really right into the late 1930s. It was only really when the war kicked off that things started to come 
to life again in Belfast, so much so that um, the then Prime Minister of Northern Ireland had been in office for 19 years, Sir James Craig, then known as Lord Craig Abham, um, surveyed uh, the Belfast dockside, you know, in the full flow of, uh, of commerce and industry um, sometime around September, October 1939 and was um, quietly satisfied and smiling that things were as they should be, you know, and that Northern Ireland was back to its old self again. Um, but um, I would have to say that um, while things looked rosy right at the beginning of the war, um, Northern Ireland was definitely going to experience a very tough and very trying time um, in, in its history in the years that would lie ahead. Um, it would be subjected to one of the worst blitzes to um, be mounted on any British city, particularly re a, a British regional city of the entire war. Um, there would be uh, great strains upon society. And also not to mention the fact that um, as a part of, uh, part of the island of Ireland that has always been morbidly afraid of invasion uh, from either side and... Um, I don't think is taken kindly to large incursions of of troops. Northern Ireland was a part of the island that would be subject to repeated invasion uh, during the course of the Second World War with the British and Commonwealth divisions and later with American uh, units flooding in in their tens, actually even hundreds of thousands at various different points uh, during the war. So that the, and there would be a lot of people that would pass through Northern Ireland um, during the course of the war service. So definitely, um, definitely the region was um, was um, it, it definitely experienced something um, very unique in its history, perhaps completely unique to what had been experienced during the First World War, and uh, it did so having already having already been under the, um, how should I say this? There was great, great um, division within Northern Irish society. Um, as we know, um, at the beginning of the war, um, you had loyalty being registered by one side of the population. Um, uh, Sir James Craig or Lord Craig Avon addressed um, the people of Northern Ireland in a BBC broadcast and um, more or less uh, said, uh, addressing this message to London, uh, said, we are King's men and we shall be with you to the end. So pledging the loyalty of uh, Northern Ireland or what was then referred to as Ulster, um, pledging, pledging their loyalty in a time of dire need and pledging it to the last man. That was the kind of rhetoric that uh, Craig Avon was using at that particular time, echoing um, the solemn pledge and covenant of 1912 and similar pledges that went on in the early part of the First World War as members of the UVF converted over for service um, in what became known as the 36 Ulster Division during the First World War, later to fight on the Somme. Um, the memories of the First World War and the memories of um, the willingness of members of the Ulster Unionist population and indeed parts of the nationalist community as well to render service in defense of the realm in loyalty to the king was something that was brought up again in the context of service in the Second World War. It would not play out that way though. Um, meanwhile, within nationalist West Belfast and in other parts of Northern Ireland where there was a strong connection perhaps to um, to uh, militant republicanism, particularly um, and particularly were, were in districts where the IRA held quite a, quite a quite a degree of sway with the population. Uh, you had um, anti-war and a sort of a sort of anti anti conscription and anti unionist and anti British rhetoric playing out in the form of graffiti on walls. Uh, such slogans um, appeared in the walls as um, up the IRA, down, down with the English, um, ARP for English slaves, IRA for um, Irish heroes. Uh, rhetoric of this particular nature, you had all these slogans being painted on walls and there were also bonfires 
um, in total viola violation of blackout um, procedures that were been instituted by the ARP. And um, there was definitely a considerable amount of unrest within certain quarters of Northern Irish society. This did not, for the most part throughout the war, spill over into um, intercommunal um, um, or ethnic conflict between both sides. And for the most part, in despite, despite quite a number of provocations at various different points, uh, things remained on an even keel throughout the war. But the threat of an eruption of intercommunal violence and also the threat, I must say, of intervention from neutral Southern Ireland or intervention from the British government um, and in particular the British army stationed in Northern Ireland at that time in quite considerable numbers uh, was something that loomed over the population, over both communities. And it was a very, very careful balancing act that local authorities had to maintain in order to make sure that the peace was kept throughout the war. And um, I, I still come across people who are surprised to find that there was never any conscription in Northern Ireland. Um, however, people from, you know, unionist, loyalist backgrounds and, and nationalist backgrounds as well did work towards the war effort in many different ways, including signing up. Um, what, what sort of numbers of, of men and women from Northern Ireland are we talking about? According to my uh, research, and it's very important to note, Northern Ireland has the great fortune of being the only recruiting area in the whole of the UK where the figures were properly maintained for recruitment during the Second World War. And not only that, but uh, the uh, army authorities, perhaps with assistance um, from colleagues in Stormont, um, um, civil servants in Stormont um, were, had the foresight to make proper account of the numbers that were coming into recruiting centres all over Northern Ireland. And this took account not of nationalist and unionist. It took account of Northern Irish recruits generally, as well as recruits that were coming over the border from the neutral south. You see, there were uh, one of the things about Northern Ireland was Northern Ireland was the only part of the island of Ireland at that point where one could register for service in the British Armed Forces if you were if you were an Irish national. Uh, prior to prior to that, up until about nineteen thirty eight, one could actually uh, turn up at a recruiting centre in what was then Spike Island um, or. Uh, or, or um, Queenstown, uh, the Royal Navy base in Cork. So you, you were actually able to, um, you, one could actually join the Royal Navy or the British Army at the British Armed Forces facilities um, down in Cork. So, and, and many people did. There were at least three cases that I've come across of people in the 1930s that actually registered, signed up for the British forces using those facilities before those facilities were formally handed over by the British to the Irish government in 1938 and early 1939. But thereafter, after early 1939, one had to either travel to mainland Britain or to travel across the border, go normally going by train from Dublin to Belfast to join at a recruiting centre somewhere at some major urban centre or major town in Northern Ireland. It could be Oma, it could be Newry, um, it could be um, Derry City, Londonderry, or it could be nor quite normally it was actually Belfast, particularly the combined um, recruiting centre, combined armed forces recruiting centre on Clifton Street in central Belfast. This was this was the place that soaked up the vast majority of recru recruits throughout, not just not just throughout the whole of Greater Belfast, not just throughout the whole of Northern Ireland. The greater amount of recruits from the whole island of Ireland came to Clifton Street in Belfast. Everybody else, if they didn't sign up at another major centre in Northern Ireland, they went over uh, to Britain. And what we have in terms of the recruiting tallies uh, that were recorded at all these recruiting centres and submitted at the end of every quarter, what we have is a figure of around 71,450, exactly that number. 
which is broken down. It, it is um, two to one in favor of the South, roughly. If one reconfigures the, 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 the figures as they were kept, they were maintained cumulatively. And um, there was a mistake, an error made in the figures at the beginning because they weren't making separations between Northern Irish and Southern Irish recruits. So at the beginning for the first year and a half of the war, Southern Irish recruits were northern were, were lumped in with the Northern Irish tally, which made the figures inaccurate. But there, but the unique advantage of that is if you take the figures for, for from 1941 until 1945, where they start making separations, you can actually uh, do some interesting statistical work because those figures can be taken as accurate because of that separation. But if you if you if you realign the figures based on the proportion that's coming up from 41 to 45, and that's a very crude method of trying to kind of approximate the numbers correctly, you're coming up at a two to one ratio of recruits uh, between South and North. Um, and in terms of percentage of population, um, or um, it, it, in terms of what was recruited on the island of Ireland, it's coming up as 1.3% of population um, in neutral Ireland, uh, as it was then, um, or uh, as, sorry, as it was last recorded. So the last census taken in, in, in the Southern Irish state was in 1936. And uh, that took the population at somewhere just above 2.1 million. Um, and there was a lot of heavy immigration at that time. So if you take if you take um, the number of recruits about between 45 and 46,000 in the Northern Ireland recruiting areas, percentage of that population, it's coming up at 1.3%. And then if you take um, the uh, a similar statistic for, uh, for, um, for Northern Ireland, you're coming up at one6 um, and what that basically tells us is that the proportion of recruits coming from both areas of the island is, is, is percentage-wise, is roughly approximate. Um, the reason why recruiting tallies are not coming up with very large numbers, the reason why it's it's coming up as 26, 27,000 for Northern Ireland as opposed to what they've always said, 45 or 50,000, is because of the fact that in terms of the actual numbers, they don't really have a firm idea how many Irish recruits North and South joined during the Second World War. And it actually was something that became a very big political problem in Northern Ireland during the Second World War. Um, the low numbers of recruits that were coming from uh, both the Unionist and Nationalist community. And it sort of put pay to this whole concept, this very loyalist concept, of equality of sacrifice, which um, unionist politicians like uh, Carson and Craig had banged on about uh, quite consistently from before and during the second, sorry, the First World War. So it is a um, it is something that was very important from a political viewpoint from the unionist community, um, and also they were a little bit worried that they were finding even the loyal elements of the Northern Irish population, the traditionally loyal elements, quite resilient to the call to arms. And they were wondering to themselves, how can we provoke more men to go off and fight? Um, you know, and there were all sorts of um, insults that were being hurled by, I have to say, the, um, the Catholic media, both in Ireland and also in, in England as well. The English Catholic media also got stuck in at various different points. In 1940, for instance, uh, orange marches were suspended um, by order of the government. Um, um, it, there were a number of reasons for it, but it was actually, it, it was said that it was uh, something to do with public safety. And um, the um, I'm not going to repeat what the headline was in the um, in the Catholic Herald, which is an English Catholic publication, but it was a, a little bit insulting towards um, uh, members of the Orange Order. Um, and um, I think really one of the reasons why also they felt, and it was one of the reasons why one of the reasons why the uh, the Orange Order suffered a little bit of negative publicity during the Second World War is because uh, the impression that was being given to British soldiers stationed in Northern Ireland of, you know, thousands of young Orangemen parading in the streets, you know, uh, with fife and drums, um, when there was a real need for manpower 
in the British forces, growing need from 1940 to 41, uh, would have given the wrong impression to members of the Welsh and Midland divisions that were stationed in Northern Ireland at the time that were basically, you know, they were on the forefront of Northern Ireland's defence and would have been fighting in the event of an invasion. Um, so we can get on to the topic of conscription, uh, though, if you want to ask the question about uh, how conscription was managed, how the conscription issue was managed at the political level in Northern Ireland. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we could um, possibly have, have an entire episode solely on conscription, but but yeah, let, let's go with it because it's it's something that it's something I wasn't even aware of the nuances and complexities of, you know, until relatively recently, uh, mainly through talking to yourself. So um, yeah, let, let's dive in. Well, to begin with, conscription first comes up um, in 1917-18. So it's a this is a First World War legacy. So when we talk about the anti-conscription campaign campaigns that took place in Northern Ireland in 39 and 41, particularly in 41, um, really what they're doing is they're taking a copy and paste model um, of what happens in 1918. The, the major anti-conscription campaign uh, that, uh, that took place uh, throughout the entire island of Ireland in 1918 in objection to the British government's attempt, to Lloyd George's attempt to conscript Irishmen to replace the losses um, on the Western Front that have been suffered as a result of the Ludendorff Offensive. Uh, this, this, is a, this is an act which even Unionist leaders like Carson, they immediately recognise that it put a, this, this does for the, uh, the Irish Home Rule Party and ensures that they will be replaced by Sinn Féin in the 1918 general election, which is what happens. So it's a political watershed in terms of Irish political history. Um, and so there is a recognition, I think, by all sides that uh, they, many members of the unionist community do feel that conscription needs to be introduced because they feel that it's actually a method of discipline that the population needs. And um, what they, what they, what, but what many also recognise is that conscription is so potentially explosive in the context of Ireland that it's actually, as what Churchill later says in 1941, is is more trouble than it's worth. So, what happens is in 1939 there is a contemplation of the extension of what's no, then known as compulsory national service, which is introduced by Chamberlain in 1938 as part of pre-wartime mobilisation measures. So he's really getting the population ready for war and he's enrolling as many men as he can in, in military service just to really get things moving and it's very important that he does that as soon as possible he's already engaged um british industry in a rearmament program running from 1935 to 36 but in 38 particularly with the munich crisis um and um growing instability in in central europe with um with nazi aggression uh, Chamberlain needs to get the population ready and he needs to start mobilising men of military age um, to get things kick-started. Northern Ireland is exempt from this, but it is the contemplation of the extension of conscription to Northern Ireland, which is Sir, is Sir James Craig, Lord Craig Avon, as Prime Minister, is pushing Chamberlain on um, quite vehemently. And, want, and, and he wants it introduced. He feels conscription needs to be introduced and feel very strongly about it. And eventually it gets to a point where Chamberlain um, announces that he's going to bring it before Parliament. And the immediate reaction from Irish nationalists in Northern Ireland, from the nationalist community in Northern Ireland, and from the government in, in Dublin, led by Eamon de Valera, is one of abject horror and refusal to accept um, the prospect of conscription. And really what happens is that the British government, at a time when the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, are actually engaged in a, a campaign of violence against the British state, they, it was around about this time that the IRA commenced a, um, a campaign of violence which results in bomb attacks on British cities, including Coventry. Um, um, it, it, it is against the backdrop of all of this that Chamberlain has to consider relations with um with the Irish state, with the Irish free state, um, can he afford to 
introduce conscription in the north if it's going to uh, exacerbate tensions um, with with the southern Irish state and if it's going to provoke uh, such hostility that it might lead to open rebellion on the streets of Northern Ireland from the nationalist community. Um, and also the reaction from the from the Irish communities overseas in uh, Commonwealth territories like Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and Canada from uh, the Irish American community in the United States and from, from other uh, cross sections of um, international interest um, that the Irish government are successful in lobbying, including the Vatican, it becomes quite clear that introducing conscription as a pre wartime measure is not going uh, to be, it's not going to go down very well and could lead to a destabilization of the political situation in Northern Ireland. So Chamberlain has a meeting with Craig Avon and he tells Craig, I can't do this. Um, don't push for this. His words are, do not push for this. It will only be an embarrassment. And Craig, after a moment of reflection, says to Chamberlain, very well, I won't. And he backs down. And the issue goes away for exactly two years. So that's May 1939. And then it comes back in the aftermath of the Belfast Blitz in late April, early May, of 1941, almost exactly two years later. And at this particular point, conscription is, is um, they're, they're advocating that it be introduced uh, in order to restore public discipline in the aftermath of the raids, because there is a real breakdown of public discipline in, in, um, in the Belfast area because of the fact that the city has been comprehensively smashed by the raids, um, 56,000 houses, are destroyed or damaged beyond repair. And um, people are crowding out of Belfast in their tens of thousands. There are um, you know, homeless refugees wandering around the outskirts of the city or in the countryside, or they're making their way to Dublin, or they're making their way to any number of towns and urban centers throughout Northern Ireland and in the South, as well as over to the UK. And it's, it's a very, very desperate situation. And there's a huge amount of anger and resentment towards the Northern Ireland government for the lack of preparedness in the face of these air raids. So John McDermott, the Minister for Public Security, is absolutely convinced that the best way to actually restore order and morale is to introduce conscription in order to mobilize the population more effectively. And the Northern Irish government fall into line behind this proposal and Churchill uh, himself says that actually it really is time that the Northern Irish population is subject to the rigors of conscription and he figures that he can get about 45,000 conscripts out of Northern Ireland if he introduces it. Um, but ultimately, um, again, there is a huge backlash from the Northern Irish nationalist community. And you see at a time when wartime restrictions are in place, you see mass rallies and mass demonstrations, the large, largest one being uh, a gathering of about 20,000 anti-conscription um, protesters um, at a public venue uh, where you have leading Nor Northern Ireland Nationalist Party members, as well as Cardinal McRory, and um, they um, are signing an anti-conscription pledge, which is exactly the same as the one that was circulated uh, around Ireland in 1918, an objection to conscription. Um, the wording is consonant with the law of God, so in the same way that um, unionist leaders, particularly religious leaders, uh, invoke the name of God in terms of rendering loyalty to king and country in its hour of need, Irish nationalists are also bringing God into it when it comes to refusing to serve king and country and, um, and refusing to recognise um, the needs um, that, um, that Britain and, and the United Kingdom real needs that they have in the face of such grave danger from the continent of Europe. Um, and it's a time of great tension and it threatens to spill over into uh, outright rebellion against the government. And the, there's a possibility that this these peaceful protests and peaceful demonstrations will spill over into violence. Um, but re actually, some historians have said that the, the anti-conscription campaigns of uh, 1941, the anti-conscription campaign of May 1941, 
um, was really what might have led to NICRA and the rise of um, the Northern Irish um, protest movement uh, that we that was seen in the 1960s, uh, protesting for equal rights um, with Protestants. The, they, they say that really the antecedents of um, of um, the peaceful demonstration movement that grew in Northern Ireland during this time can be traced back to the anti-conscription campaign that that started in 1941. And many people have memories of that anti-conscription campaign, but it's very little known now today. And as part of their finest hour, we're looking for uh, any um, sort of um, poster or leafleting or any information that people might have pertaining to this um, that might be kept in their attics or cupboards that could be brought into the Linen Hall event on Saturday, June 17th and uh, shared with us in order to capture what the nationalist view of these events were. Um, ultimately, how the anti-conscription campaign of 41 comes to an end, how it concludes, is um, Churchill recognising the, the extent of the protests in Northern Ireland the severity of the protests that have been registered by the Irish government and the Irish diplomatic service in London, and also the stink that they kick up again in the United States and throughout Commonwealth countries and other countries in the world. And all these protests have been registered on formal diplomatic channels, including the American, um, the American ambassador in London. Uh, it is recognized that, um, again, they have to drop this idea. And uh, this is when Churchill stands up in Parliament. I think it was around May 5th, 1941, he, he announced in Parliament that it would be more trouble than it's worth to introduce conscription in Northern Ireland. And the whole plan was quietly buried. And th then the issue of conscription or the possibility of conscripting uh, members of the Northern Irish population for military service during the war was never raised again after this point. Well, that's, uh, that's a whole can of worms that uh, can be opened and explored. Uh, yeah. For, for, for many, many hours. Um, I think um, we, we've, got so much to say that we have, we haven't got three today you know we we could have talked more about the blitz more about the american uh, gis uh 300,000 of whom passed through northern ireland um but if uh yeah if people are interested and want to talk more uh about the second world war with either myself or uh joe then remember you can come down to the linen hall um in belfast on the 17th of june um, we will we will be there. We'll be happy to hear your stories and scan and photograph uh, any documents or items that you have. Um, Joseph, how if people can't come along to the library on that day, how and where can they find out more about their finest hour? Well, um, the best way to find out more about their finest hour is to visit our website. There, you can visit our website at their finest hour, all one word, dot org. That's their finest hour, dot org. And if you enter that into your search bar and uh, visit our website, you will um, be able to explore our website in depth. There are several functions or options you you have. Uh, you can you can view our media outputs. Um, we have a podcast series as well. Um, the fifth episode will be released next week. It's by the same name, Their Finest Hour. You can get it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And um, this is the official podcast of the project. And it um, is uh, it basically show, is showcasing uh, the kind of work that we are doing. It also features interviews with leading contributors. And uh, what we're trying to do is we're really trying to, uh, I suppose, blend... Um, uh, our um, coverage of um, basically the project with also very nuanced topics and sort of, shall we say, um, special episodes where people, you know, provide guest interviews, you know, uh, subject specialists, and uh, also uh, occasional forays into the very rich archive collections that are held at the University of Oxford, which pertain to many very interesting nuanced aspects of um of, of uh, britain's experience in the second world war so if you tune into our podcast um you will be able to listen to the great variety of content that we'll be able to share with you um in terms of uploading your story 
if you visit their finest org and click on uh, the share your story button, which you'll find either at the top of the page or on in the middle of uh, the home page as you enter the website. And um, if you wish to share your story, you can do so. Just click on the link and you will see it's very, very straightforward. It's like filling out any ordinary questionnaire form. Just follow the instructions, read the terms and conditions before you agree to uh, submit your story in whatever form you wish to give it. And also remember that um, as part of the terms and conditions, you also have the right to have your story, once it's submitted, withdrawn from the archive at any time. Um, and uh, also, if you wish to uh, follow our events or to sign up for any events or to sign up as a volunteer, what you can do is you can click on the event um, button and essentially check out uh, what events, whether they're training events or collection day events, are running in any given part of the United Kingdom. And also, if you wish, if you're interested in participa participating in the project as an actual um, member, as a volunteer, um, and perhaps running your own collection day event, you can click on the volunteer button and sign up. And we can also register you for one of our train, online training events, and we can we can train you up and show you how to run your own collection day or to partake in one as a volunteer. Well, Joseph, you're very clearly uh, clearly a, a very busy man with this project. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out uh, to chat with us here on A Wee Bit of War. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you back in Belfast next month. Hopefully some of our listeners will be there to say hello to you. Um, but I think for now, uh, until then, I'd just like to say uh, cheers and take care and I'll see you soon. Thank you very much, Scott. It's been a great pleasure. Subscribe to A Wee Bit of War on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favourite shows. That way, you'll never miss an episode. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your co-workers, break all the rules of the Official Secrets Act, and why not leave us a review to help others find the podcast. Thank you for joining myself and Dr. Joseph Quinn, and I look forward to your company again next time for another Wee Bit of War. <laughs>